Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Um, hi, my name's Sandra, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Sandra. Give me a minute to get my breath here. Um, my sober date is 6-7-2018, and I'm really grateful to be here today. Uh, thank you, Julie, for asking me. Um, as terrified as I am standing here, it really is an honor, and I can't believe I've made it over a year, so this is mind-boggling. Um my stage fright is very real. This is giving me flashbacks right now to eighth grade. Um, uh, in my desperate attempt to try to fit in and be a part of, I had a friend who was trying out for the lead role in a school play, and I decided to go along with her and try it out for um, a part that had like two lines. And instead, I landed her role, which didn't make me a part of anything with her, but um, also... <laughs> I was good through the uh, practice, and then the opening night, I walked out on stage, and it was a melodrama. It was very dramatic, but <laughs> I walked out on stage, opening line, feeling good, looked out at the crowd, and fell to my knees crying, <laughs> and that was not part of the drama of the play. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that's where I'm feeling right now, so just keep that in mind. <laughs> um, so, that's how it was. Uh, I... I have a very complicated, large family. I um, had a very tumultuous childhood. Uh, nothing truly horrible happened to me, but uh, just conditions that children shouldn't be in. Um, I was raised by a, an alcoholic, one of us, um, and a stepfather who, it was the 80s, and he couldn't deal with her, so he picked up a coke habit. And working in restaurants in the 80s, that was acceptable. Um, he and she, they never touched us, but they would get in, knock down, drag out fist fights. And so I became my brother's protector from the very beginning. Um, and I would throw dance parties in the room, turn up the music really loud. And uh, I became more like a mother than a sister to him for most of our lives. And my mom and dad finally separated Um my mom continued to drink, and when he would leave, it got worse. Um, so, like, I don't really have a lot of memories before double digits, like, clear. Um, and some of the things I remember were things like, you know, her needing to go to the bar, so I would put together our Easter baskets and put them out while my brother was asleep, or her coming home really early in the morning and waking me up, and she couldn't remember where she'd been, so I would have to walk to the local bar and see if a car was there. Um, things like that. And I swore I would never be like her, and I hated her. Um, but I also did everything in my power to protect her and to protect our family because I was so afraid of fear, just fear of change. Um, so to, to the outside world, every, I kept everything looking perfect. Um, down the road, we, uh, we, moved, we moved to Georgia. We moved back to Georgia. This was all in Colorado. We moved back to Georgia, which is where my mom's family is from. And my mom has a large family, and they quickly picked up on what was going on. Uh, my aunt and uncle ended up adopting me, and I gained two brothers and a brother and a sister that were, you know, had been cousins, which is part of where the complication and the large family comes in. Uh, my dad got his act together and went on to got, get remarried, and I have a little brother there too. Um, as far as drinking, I know that it wasn't the very first drink I ever had, but the first time I remember drinking was in high school. I remember being at a party, and I I remember drinking keg beer and thinking it was the most disgusting thing ever. And I don't remember having like this feeling like I arrived, or like I just remember thinking that I felt like I was a part of something, and everybody else was drinking it, and it kind of, like, I felt... Like, I was more outgoing and actually talking to people. And I didn't really relate that to the beer. I just thought I, it was in my hand, and I was nervous, and I was talking to people. So I'm going to keep drinking it. And then I kept emptying, and I kept drinking it. Um, and that kind of became a thing. Um, I was never 
I wasn't like a, a you know, drinking every day or drinking a, a whole ton from the very beginning. It would just, you know, it slowly progressed. But when it was available, I would drink it. And it didn't really matter if I liked it or not. Um, it never mattered if I liked it or not. I, I did at some point along the way become, um, a classy drinker as far as, uh, I, I developed a taste for certain things. So I liked really nice red wines and I liked really good bourbons and really good gins, but, um, I didn't make my drinking any classier. It just made it more expensive. <laughs> um, so that was, yeah. yeah. Uh, and when that, when the good stuff ran out, I didn't, didn't care. I would drink whatever was available. I hated vodka, but God, I drink many, many gallons of it. So, um, it didn't really matter. Um, through my drinking, I, in the beginning I was, there were drugs involved too. And I just, I, especially with the drugs, I could pick them up and put them down and it didn't bother me. And so I was just. So I was like, oh, I don't have an addictive personality like my mom. I'm fine. And going forward with the drinking, like I always just, I hated her so much and swore I would never be like her. And I was convinced that I wasn't. I, because I could take it or leave it. It didn't matter that I was thinking about it when I left it and that I couldn't stop thinking about it, but I could take it or leave it. And as far as I was concerned, she never could. And, um, and then there was the whole classy factor, like I drink good stuff. So that didn't count. Um, over time, uh, you know, I started realizing that with my really good friends, uh, when we were out, I was counting their drinks because I was ahead of them and I couldn't get too far ahead because that would be weird. That would look like I was an alcoholic. Um, so I started making different friends that could drink, that did drink like I did. Um, I still kept those friends and I, um, but I had other friends on the side. Uh, I started making small geographics. I was still too afraid in adulthood to actually do um, any big change. I was really afraid to move away from my family and my friends in Georgia. So I started making small changes pretty um, pretty quickly, like around the Atlanta area. Uh, just I certain bars and stuff would. Kind of where I'd wear out my welcome, so I would move to a different move to a different neighborhood or get a new job where I wasn't drinking as much, which never lasted long, or do whatever. And then um, finally, in 2012, I decided to move here, and I knew one person here, and I sold it to everybody as like it was just time for me to you know it was time for me to be brave. I've never been brave. I'm just going to move across the country and going to be, it's going to be great. Like I don't have, like I had a job, but it wasn't necessarily a career and I wasn't, you know, I had broken off my engagement many years before that. And so there was no, I had a rent, not mortgage. And, um, so I ended up here, uh, and something I left out too, there was a lot, there was with my little brother that I had taken care of, um, all those years, he broke his neck when he was 21. And so I quit my job and again, taken on the role of his mom and taking care of him. And, uh, I don't know that like when I had something to take care of, whether it be a guy that was a fixer upper or my brother, my brother who actually needed medical attention, like it helped me drink a little bit less. Um, and then when those things were gone, like I would have to fill the void with something. Um, and my brother was living on his own now and he would, you know, he, he had his own house and he had a girlfriend and he had things and I was like, okay, so what, what do I do now? Uh, so I moved to Washington thinking that was going to help. And, um, I did for a little bit, for a minute, and then I quickly, um, I went back to working in restaurants because that's uh, easy, and I quickly found my way to back to friends who drink a lot. Uh, therefore, I started drinking a lot again as well, which is what I wanted anyway. Um, my overtime, time does go fast. I can just sit last forever. Uh, <laughs> um, overtime... Um, or over the, over the six years that followed that, I began drinking more and more frequently and more and more at a time. Um, it was no longer, it was no longer fun. Uh, at one point, you know, it had been fun. Like I remember in college, it was fun that, that my, you know, that my guy friends would go up to other people and bet on me that I could out drink them. And that wasn't a fun, it wasn't fun anymore. Um, my lists of uh, things that I always did and things that I never did. So that made me not an alcoholic. Um, 
that that list was getting smaller and smaller. I in the last days I was I was a rest, I was a uh, general manager of a restaurant, and I went from when I took that job the first year, uh, the staff would make jokes when it was going to be my next when my day off the next day, and just be like, "Oh, so you're off today? So you're only going or you're off tomorrow? So you're only going to be here nine hours tomorrow?" Like. You know, or what time are you going to show up? And so that, because I was there all the time to, at the end, I could, I would, if, if I came in at all, I had, um, I had a bottle of vodka, which we've already determined I hated, uh, hidden in the shredder. And I really was only made, I could make it a few hours because I always overshot the mark. And then I would have to go home with a migraine. Um, when I decided to get sober, um, that last couple weeks of drinking, um, part of that included going to see my youngest brother in Colorado who had lost his wife two years before that. Um, and we were kind of having a memorial service for her and all of these things like with my family and stuff had just only fueled my drinking or I let them fuel my drinking. And I had to kind of stop drinking for a minute, uh, right before I went on that trip. And then I convinced myself that it'd be weird if I wasn't picking because they're all going to ask questions and this weekend's not about me. And then before I knew it, I couldn't stop again, um, you know, within a day. So I came, when I got back to Washington, I had like what I can only describe as an out of body experience. I literally, um, got down on my knees and I just said, I can't do this anymore. Um, the fear of staying the same had finally outgrown the fear of change. And my family was coming in town and we were supposed to go on vacation and like three days before they got there, I decided I needed to drink up what was left in the house, if that made sense. And the last day and a half before they got there, I barely remember anything. And then uh, when they got there, I had to have that conversation with them. Most of them had no idea, which is strange. But um, And they took me to detox. And even then, I was lying to myself, like, because I wanted to go to rehab, and then they were like, we well, have to go to detox, and then the detox was four days. And I remember having a conversation with my mom, like, because um, I had to make a work deposit, and I was like, oh, I'll just make it next week when I'm done. It'll be fine. And she's like, you really think you're just going for four days? And like, that, you're going to be healed. Mm-hmm. And, like, and then for a second, I did. I was like, yeah, yeah, that should work. Um, <laughs> but anyways, I, I'm running out of time. So I went I went to treatment, and that whole thing, though, was it, the, way, the reason I say it was an out-of-body experience is because I can, I can still see it, like, I was saying and doing all these things that weren't me. They weren't the things I wanted to do. They weren't, but I was willing and I did it. And I don't, I don't know how that happened other than by the grace of my higher power. And I went in there willing. And even when like people would say something to me in treatment and I was just like, that's in my head. I'm like, no, that's, I'm not going to do it. Absolutely. How do I do that? Let me do it. And, um, I don't know. I don't know how that happened. Uh, but it got me involved in this program and I went to a place called Residence 12, not realizing that the 12 stood for 12 steps and that it was going to land me in AA. <laughs> but, um, but I'm so glad that it did. And, uh, this last year has just been a godsend, literally. Like, I don't, I don't know how I am where I am today. I don't know how I'm sober. I don't know how, like, the obsession was lifted. It just, it just was. And, like, being a part of this program and being here with all of you guys and, it has brought so much joy to my life, uh, which is something I never really experienced other than in moments before, you know, occasional moments. And now it's, um, now I can, I feel it all the time, even when things aren't great. Um, and I know that, and I'm not saying come to meetings just because you get things out of it, but like when I'm doing the work and when I'm and my program's not perfect. I, I should call my sponsor more. I'm still working on like, figuring out what meditation is best for me. And uh, I probably don't pray as much as I should, but I do regularly. And it's, it just, it makes all the difference. And when I'm able to hand it all over to God, which, you know, I still have a little bit of a power struggle sometimes, but um, <laughs> when I'm able to do it, it just frees up so much of my life, so much of my head space, my emotions, my mental space, just to, to enjoy life and to be there for other people. And I just, I don't know how it is that this program works. I really don't, but, but it does. So I'm just going to keep doing the work and, um, it's yeah. Uh, I have 18 seconds and <laughs> so I'm going to wrap it up there, but, uh, thank you so much for my sobriety. You guys.
I'm Clarence. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, welcome, everybody. Happy Easter. Man, what a blessing to uh, see, the, see this many people, you know, on Easter Sunday. Uh, my uh, sobriety date is uh, 821. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, 821-11, uh, August 18th, August the 21st. August 18th is my birthday. And that's when I was going to, that was my last drunk, right? So I had two bottles of wine and a half a pint of tequila. So I was going to go into AA the next day, but I had a bottle of tequila left. So, <laughs> you know, I, I had to finish that off. Uh, so, you know, I, I just want to pause for about 30 seconds for my sponsor who just died. Who is my best friend? Thank you so much. <clears throat> Man, gosh, I feel like I've been waiting for this moment all my life, right? <laughs> then sometimes I, you know, like I ask myself, why do you volunteer? But, you know, I, I remember the first time I volunteered to speak, it was about four years ago. And so it was three months out that I was scheduled to speak, right? And every day, man, I was thinking about what I'm going to say, man, what I was going to do. And it was just, I mean, it just blew me away. But now, you know, it's so different. Uh, I was asked about three weeks ago, and I just told myself, hey, boom, it is what it is. And, you know, I didn't I didn't have no fear or no fright or anything like that, you know, because uh one thing that AA have taught me is is uh, I don't have to prove myself to nobody, and I have learned to accept myself for who I am. Uh, you know, and this program has uh, really uh, given me a life that is just unimaginable. You know, uh, just like what Jamie was talking about, being on Mount Rainier, I've been up there twice, and Baker and St. Helens and Adams and you know it's just this program man it's, it's just unbelievable you know you just got to come to believe you got to come to believe in a power greater than yourself that will restore your sanity man and I tell you what faith it works it works I, I, I would vouch for that <clears throat> in a heartbeat. But anyway, just quickly, my sponsor, Vince, Vince uh, Bailey, he had 34 years of service. And man, you know, I, he was my sponsor for five years. And, and I really bonded with him, though. And I really learned a lot about the program. You know, he taught me this is a program of action, giving back. Man, you got to be in it to win it. You you got to be in this program. Those steps are designed for living, and they work. They are a guideline, but in action. So anyway, I'm I'm gonna just tell you a little about myself. Uh, my home is Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, I was born and raised there uh, until I left. But anyway, like my childhood. Uh, actually, I started out in Catholic school, uh, and that was probably the best thing that ever happened to me uh, for the first three or four years. Uh, my mom, she grew up in a Catholic home, and uh, when I, you know, I lived in a, uh, a black neighborhood, and uh, it was just like three families that was in Catholic school back then. Uh, and you had to pay money, I guess. And I don't, I, I don't understand why my mom put us in Catholic school, though. But that was the best thing that ever happened to me, though. It gave me some morals and some values at a, at a young age that I that I thought that uh, I grew up with. Not not all, but some. I had a I had a foundation. But anyway, you know, I come from an alcoholic family. Uh, my mom drank, my dad, my uncles, my friends, all my neighbors, uh, beer bottles, roaches crawling out of beer bottles. It, it was just, 
um, it, it wasn't natural. It wasn't natural if you didn't drink. You know, it's, it's just, it's not natural, I don't think, uh, being sober. I don't, I don't think it's a natural thing. But the thing about my childhood, uh, I grew up doing segregation. And a lot of my feelings that I have today was based on my childhood. I had a lot of fear. I had a lot of shame. Uh, I didn't like being black. You know, I wanted to be white. You know, white was right. Uh, and I seen a lot of things happening in the South. Uh, I was a paper boy um, at seven years old. I sold papers and I read a lot as a kid and I seen a lot, you know, but I, I, I had a lot of fear. Uh, and, and my family was, you know, just kind of, it was a, I, I don't want to say, but maybe dysfunctional in a way. I didn't, I didn't get the, the emotional, uh, 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 nourishing. I got it from my mom, but my brothers and sisters and my dad and, and, uh, I, I grew up with a stepfather, my, my real father. <clears throat> I didn't see him till I was 13 years old. He had just got out of prison for, uh, robbing a bank. And, uh, I seen him one time after that, though. But, you know, I was okay, though. Uh, my uh, goal was to leave Louisville growing up. I, I didn't like uh, how I was living. So in the seventh grade, I went to live with my oldest sister because she had just got out of the military. She was kind of like the only sane one in my family that had some sanity, right? So... Um, that way, you know, I had a room by myself. And I, I grew up, uh, uh, I was, I was selfish, you know, uh, narcissist early on. And it just the way it was. Uh, and, and I had a very emotional, uh, uh, childhood because my mom and dad, you know, wow, man, it was, my dad was very abusive to my mom, and, man, and we moved from pillar to post. My dad would come home from work, and we would be gone, moving truck, backed up, and truck loaded, and he didn't even know where we went, and that, that happened several times. But, you know, I, I had a lot of emotional trauma, though, but, you know, I kept my head on. I, I've always worked, but but drinking, though, I think my drinking started it was kind of by default because, you know, uh, we always had like uh, in the refrigerator, especially in the summer, though, when it got hot. Uh, and my dad, uh, every payday, they bought a case of beer, those long bottlenecks back in the day. And uh, so we would have like for dinner every day we had Kool-Aid, but sometimes we had Kool-Aid left over but not often but uh it was always Kool-Aid, buttermilk and beer in the refrigerator right so it was rarely ever Kool-Aid left over though but it was between buttermilk and beer so I don't know if anybody ever had buttermilk <laughs> it's not it's, you see what I'm saying but the beer was ice cold but, but the beer was cold you know and I was always you know, just quenching my thirst, you know. So that's when I started drinking beer. And, and, you know, in high school, we would go out, drink with the fellows. You know, that's when they had the uh, uh, Ripple, Boone's Farm, Annie Green, TJ Swan, Mad Dog, MD 2020. You know, and I, I got started drinking there. And, uh, but, you know, it, it was it was a good neighborhood. It was about always 25 or 30 kids we all came together though you know and and we just accept the condition the 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 condition the conditionings uh uh with with pride and joy you know and, and there but i don't know there, there was a lot of uh things going on though but 
in a way. So right after high school, <clears throat> I got drafted into the military. Uh, uh, I'm a Vietnam veteran. And so when I got into the military, um, I just I, I didn't drink a lot, though, but the military really helped change my life because uh, I got stationed over in Japan. <clears throat> and uh, before I got into this squadron, I had to test in. I had on the two I had I had on the two years. So they was only taking buck sergeants. So I had a tutor uh, that helped me study because I was in the Air Force. And in the Air Force, you got promoted by, it was a percentile, how you test out. But anyway, so I made buck sergeant under two years. And that's all I did for about almost a month, which is study, study, study. But anyway, man, that lifted my confidence. Now, you know, I have goals and uh, expectations. And uh, I'm just going to back up a, a little. I played football. Football was my way out of you know, they got me to college when I was growing up. I couldn't play in high school because I had to work to help my mom out. But after I got in the military, I was over in Japan. I played football for the Air Force over in Japan. And I didn't get into a lot of drugs over there. I smoked marijuana. That's when I started smoking marijuana was in the military. And I, I never even seen it when I was in high school back then. You know, which I thought was a really blessing because it would have just fried my brains out, you know. <laughs> so uh, in the military, I played football. Now uh, my, my, my goal was to, uh, uh, when I was in the military, my goal was to go to college, play four years of football, and to be the best photographer I can be, because I started doing photography when I was in military. And I actually, later on in my life, I did that for a living. But anyway, so after I got out of service, I walked on uh, the University of Nebraska in Omaha, and I ended up getting a scholarship for four years. So I got a football scholarship, and then so I graduated in 1980. And that was a goal of mine. You know, I, I lived my whole life wanting to make my mom happy, though, because we, you know, we had it rough growing up because uh, I had two other brothers and, man, they was always, you know, just locked up, you know. So, in a way, uh, after I got out of the military, I went to college and I, and I got a degree and I uh, played football four years. So then, uh, you know, I started working. But, you know, drinking was never a big thing of mine until later on in my life. But maybe for 20 years, I never ran out of marijuana. I, I, always, had mar I always had marijuana, right? So, but, but drinking and, and then... Uh, you know, I used to pop the pills, the crosses and the reds and all that. Uh, and then I remember uh, when I was like about 47, I kind of experienced uh, smoking crack. Uh, and, man, that's, that's the worst drug you can even touch. So I remember... You know, because I played flag football for like 17 years. And I remember a friend of mine, he found some on the football field. And we didn't really know what it was because I've never even seen crack. But so we put it in a pipe with some marijuana. And uh, that kind of, I got kind of like on a binge with that. And I remember going to this girl the first time I started looking for crack. She said, uh, Clarence. You know, you this this is not your drug. This drug will make make you cancel Christmas. This drug will make you cancel Christmas, and and it did one year. And then then I used to buy it. Uh, you know, I used to buy crack, like uh, eight ball, and I I used to buy it and 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 try to sell it to make my money back. But, you know, it was, you know, selling crack, buying crack and selling it is almost like, you know, like a monkey 
buying bananas, right? <laughs> Selling bananas. It's, it's, it's not going to happen. But, but, but in a way, so I, I stopped. I did it for about two years, and I stopped. So I started drinking at about 49. That's when my drinking got kind of, uh, you know, it was kind of a cross addiction. So that's when my drinking got kind of heavy. And so uh, I came into AA a couple of times, you know, but I, n- I never took this program serious at all uh, because I don't think I was ready, you know, uh, to surrender yet. So when I came into AA, uh, the, the, the last time I came into AA, I told myself that I was going to be committed. Uh, I was going to work this program to the fullest extent with any idea of what direction I was going to go, where it was going to take me. One thing for sure about this program, which, man, has changed my life, has influenced my life like nothing ever before, because uh, it has given me a, a, a conscious and awareness and a purpose for living. And I love life. I love life. I love you. Love is Love is my thing. Love is liberating. Love is an action. Love will set you free. Me, I have to feel like that because I have a, uh, uh, there's a lot of hate in the world. And I don't like uh, injust, you know, I, I'm just, uh, I see a lot of things happening in the world. I just don't like, but, you know, I, I have to learn to, to, you know, just, Except life on life terms, you know. So when I came into the program this last time, um, I was very committed. I was very, very committed. And I knew that uh, my reason for coming into AA is like I was emotionally bankrupt. I just come out of a codependent relationship very toxic relationship. And I was living in Woodenville uh, across the water. Uh, I don't know. I, I was probably the only black living in Woodenville at the time. I didn't know nobody. <laughs> I didn't know nobody. So when I came in the program, I told myself I was going to be committed, you know. So and, and the first thing that I had to do was to surrender, you know, and to admit And it was hard for me to admit that I was an alcoholic. It's it's hard coming into this program to admit because we start hearing everybody else's story and we start comparing stories and judging. But uh, this is all about surrendering. And and the second thing is come come to believe in a power greater than yourself. And that you know, coming to believe uh, has brought me faith in abundance, you know, and, and, and finding a God of my own understanding. Uh, and I do have a God. I have a higher power. Uh, and then the, the fourth step, you know, when I did my fourth step, you know, the uh, moral inventory, the resentments and all that. Well, you know, I found out a lot about myself. I found out a lot about myself. And that was the first time I really got honest with myself and, you know, asking God to remove all my character defects. I don't think that would ever happen to me uh, because, you know, I'm still somewhat uh, just kind of a ego. You know, this, this is, this program tell us to, uh, deflate our ego, ego edging God out. And, you know, I remember one of the problems that I had first coming into AA was I got on this pink cloud, you know, and this is a program of enlightenment. You know, we come here and we feel good. Everybody makes you feel good. Everybody makes you feel welcome to this program. So when I 
came into the program, uh, you know, I was on this pink cloud, but, you know, I felt like three or four years, three or four years in, I did a lot of service work. I did, I couldn't, I did service work continuously in this program, but I still had a, a lot of emotional wounds and conflicts that I was up here, but they they still was down here. You know, a lot of uh, inner healing that, that I still had to do. So I had to go back to the drawing board again and, you know, do some uh, self-transformation and uh, inner healing because I know when I came in, I had transcended up. And to me, I call this a spiritual bypass, you know, because I'm up here and still got issues down here. And so one thing I've, I have learned, you know, as far as my defensive mechanism that I have now, you know, I've, I've learned that self-care, uh, self-actualization, self-love, self-acceptance, you know, those are the things, the, 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 the gut check that I had to do. Uh, and in doing that, I have to learn to love me. You know, I can't love nobody until I, I mean, literally, actually love me. Love is an action. Uh, love is a, is an ability, you know, like I love you and, you know, I don't, I'm not going to say I don't care if you love me, but maybe I don't. <laughs> so, because I've learned it's, it's not wanting nothing in return. And that's my de- defensive mechanism. I, I have three beautiful daughters. I have a daughter, my oldest daughter, man. I, you know, it's just so awesome that I'm so uh, in contact with them, you know. Uh, and I give them emotional support. I want to be the man in their lives. I want to be the man in their lives. And being sober, I'm there like that. I'm there, man. My daughters are my world. Uh, I have a daughter, my oldest daughter. She's an entrepreneur. I have a daughter that uh, graduated from Harvard. She has a master's from Harvard and Marquette. She did three years in the Jesuit Volunteer Corps. She was in Peace Corps. Then my youngest daughter, she's in uh, graduate school at Georgetown University. I love my daughters. That's why I'm bragging on them, right? Because I know they love me. You know, I know they love me, you know, and I sometimes you can't love the one you're with. You know, you can't love the one you want. Just love the one you're with. You know, and I don't, I don't need everybody's love. I, I, I just don't need everybody's love anymore because I love me. And man, that's, that's, I can take that to the bank. But, you know, working these steps, uh, after I did the fourth step, fifth step, uh, asked God to remove my character defects. And then I made amends to people that I have hurt. Not all, but many. So, and then the, the tenth step, uh, a daily inventory, eleventh step, prayer and meditation, and a spiritual awakening. That's the 12th step. And when I talk about the spiritual awakening to me, it's like I try to stay on the path, the spiritual path. And if I'm not on it, you know, on my spiritual path, you know, I have love. I have empathy. I have compassion. And I try to stay up there. And, you know, sometimes I get derailed. But I know where to go back to get on. I know where to go back to get on. This this program has taught me that I can depend on the fellowship of this program, uh, the sponsor, and work my psychic change that this program has made me so consciously aware of. And I'm going to say this again. My defensive mechanism is is is, is to love. Uh, I just, I don't know. I just get bent out of shape. And I try not to when uh, 
something is not going right out there in the world because of the way I came up. But, you know, uh, yeah, I just, faith come to believe in a power greater than myself. Uh, you know, you either, you know, it's like walking in faith or sinking doubt. Uh, the, the last speaker that was up here, Jamie, <clears throat> she was talking about, and, and this program, it's just so much going on in AA. I've been to dances. I've been on many trips. I've been to Havasu Falls with AA. Uh, I've climbed mountains. And, man, I've been on a venture. You know, like, <clears throat> you know, it's like my life is today being sober is it's just unbelievable. It, it is, it's just amazing how this program can work if you work it. You know, and it's all about action. You know, just come in, come to meetings, the, the fellowship, find a sponsor, uh, get into service work, you know, giving back. That's what we do here. That's one thing I have learned, you know, being a being a uh, narcissist, I've, I've learned to come out of my selfishness. You know, when I, when I do something for others, you know, that is a... a, a inner feeling that is rewarding to me reaching out to others you know you know as i look around this room and you know it, it blows my mind that we're all alcoholics and that is our common denominator but we all have a life that i mean we all have a story we all have a story, just like my story, just like Jamie's, you know. But I, I'm, I'm blessed. I, I'm just, I, I can't tell you enough how this program has uh, changed my life, you know. And, and I think that uh, faith, you know, come to believe in a power greater than me. I said that once, but. You know, it's like the the the, the self center. You know, find a new center and get a new. You know, it's like like my life is under new management. You know, so I turn it over. But you know, we say these things, but they don't. You know, shit happens. That's my first custom word. <laughs> it happens, but we get back on the path, and that's how I live my life. And love, love, love. I love you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much. 